Blessings and welcome back everyone. And a special welcome if you're a newcomer. I know I haven't said that for a while. So if you're new to the channel, thanks for being around and tuning in. And thank you so much to all of those who are tuning in again and coming here um, to watch our content. I'm Elsa, astrologer and host of this channel, Hellenistic Astrology. And I'm joined today, tonight, with astrologer Matt Nolan from the Astrologers Encyclopedia and my co-host, for Demetra George's second volume of Ancient Astrology, Theory and Practice. We are finished with the book. Tonight's our last night. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Matt, again for being a part of this project. Um, it's special It's special because it's the last episode. So congratulations to everyone who has persevered and made it through to the end. Um, for those of you who have been participating in real time with us is kind of like a celebration moment. But for those of you who are reading the book or joining in in these episodes as you go through the book for inspiration and support, um, we appreciate you joining into the future as well. It's been such a pleasure to share and study with you guys here on YouTube. Um, and to our patrons and our study friends over there who have been diving in with us, it's been so amazing. So thank you so much. Um, a special thanks and gratitude to Demetra George, the queen, for her work and contribution to the field of astrology um, in this amazing two-part series. So again, this is volume two of her work in the field of ancient astrology. Not her only work, but um, this is, I'm sure, part of her life's work and something that was like, it's a huge deal to the field of astrology, I think. Um, so it's been a real honor to be able to go through her work and share a little bit of our study journey with everyone. So thank you all. Um, you know, she also is reading in this book and like going through her stuff. Being a teacher myself, I really notice her as like an exemplary teacher. And you can tell she has teaching experience um, when you're reading the book. She's so like kind and compassionate and thorough and patient in her writing style. And you can tell she's really enveloping a newer beginning student in her approach. And her style is just so, I don't know, intriguing, yet simple, but not like basic where she's like paring things down like too much, you know, she's like really deep and thorough. And she also has this like deeper philosophical like style for someone who's not just a very beginner. So you could like be a very beginner to ancient astrology and read this book and feel super welcome and like um, not missing anything, but also for students who already study astrology, she addresses some of the questions that arise for more like verse students, like over time, I feel like, and she might not dive into like the most complexity, but like, again, here, she's touching a topic with length of life technique, which is what we're here to discuss tonight, which is this very complex and wild very advanced technique that not a lot of people really touch and she's putting it out there in a really thorough way so I think it takes you from beginning to end of this like it's such a I don't know just a paramount work in the field um so she really engages people in her work so thank you Demetra and especially with you can tell with her um assignments at the end where she gives people a walkthrough that they're so helpful and that she really cares. So not only is she like an amazing astrologer and scholar, but I feel like in this, you really see her teaching style, her compassionate teaching style of really wanting us to engage the work. Um, and yeah, I just really appreciate that. And I'm sure you guys all have too. So we can't recommend these books enough. And thank you so much, Demetra, for doing this for all of us. Couldn't have said it better myself. Oh, great book. Yeah, it, <laughs> and, and it's been an awesome journey to share with you guys. So, okay, um, let us know in the comments below if you followed live um, or if you're tuning in in the future or where, when you're tuning in, um, how you found the book study, um, if you found it this companion to be helpful, or if there's any books that you would like to see us cover in this style. Um, 
we, if any of you want to pursue any of these topics in more depth, I do offer, offer tutoring sessions on a sliding scale. So you can just reach out. My email is in the about section of this YouTube page. And I know Matt definitely offers astrological um, pieces, like readings and stuff like that. And I'm sure you'd be willing to tutor people if that is something that they needed. Do you offer tutoring? Is that something you're willing to help people with? I never have like officially, but yeah, I, I would love to uh, tutor people if they wanted. Yeah. Yeah. So just reach out if there's like a certain piece of this, let's say you're joining in the future and you were not able to join the study group on Patreon to get that sort of tutoring style buddy situation. If you're watching this in the future and you do get sort of hung up on a few things, um, you can reach out to us and, um, you know, like sliding scale style, at least for me. And I'm sure Matt's willing to work with you on that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, feel free to reach out to us. And then one last piece of housekeeping before we dive in, um, are, we are doing another book. We are doing Firmicus Maternus Mathesis, translated by Benjamin Dykes around the new year. We're still getting our date together on exactly when we'll start, but it'll be the same kind of thing where we meet once a month and we have certain reading that we do and we come together and discuss it. And if you've ever wanted to engage in source material, this is the perfect way to do it because you don't have to sort of do the schlag by yourself. Um, and a group setting, again, it's not only an inspiration, but it's like truly helpful to get through and wrap your mind around. We are in a couple of more advanced study groups ourselves, and I'm in a uh, balance group with someone who also has access to the Greek. And it's super profound to read Valens in that way. I've been checking in with Valens, you know, for four years or something now, and there's nothing like this study group. So um, I think that that's a unique offer also that we can make with this Mathesis. It's not just like a hang, but also you have a little bit of Latin experience and our friend Christopher Scott, who's going to be doing this with us, also has the Latin of this so like if we got stuck on something or if we wanted to do a little bit of a deeper dive we have a little bit of latin when it's needed although benjamin dykes is like an amazing translator and we probably won't need it as much as we would with say like the riley translation of valens or something like that because it's not as i guess uh it's not as modern of a translation the riley translation as ben and ben's an astrologer so um i know that his um, translations are just like top notch. So anyway, we have that to offer as well as is Matt and Christopher both having some Latin. Um, so consider uh, joining us for this next study book club with Firmicus Maternus the thesis. So let's go ahead and dive in length of life technique, everyone. Okay. Just out of the gate, we are not doing any chart examples for this episode. We may come back and use the chart of Jackie O um, because she has passed and she is one of the chart uh, one of the charts that Dimitri uses as an example chart throughout this series, throughout the homework. So you're going to be familiar with the chart. We're not including it tonight because it's kind of an episode all on its own. If we have to cover all of the authors and actually describe the technique and work out the technique. So, um, you know, let us know if you want to see that. We can come back and do some demos and really kind of piece through this. Demetra doesn't give homework for this chapter, so she just kind of lays it out. So that's what we're going to try to do here for you is just a bit of a layout about what to expect in the chapter, what you'll find in the chapter, and a little bit of just our takeaways from the chapter. But most of the takeaways are the techniques themselves, which we can come back and expound upon if people are interested in doing that. Um, but for now, we're just going to get an overview as usual of the chapter um, with less um, less example charts. So length of life. We know length of life to be a super important topic for ancient astrologers. Um, every ancient astrologer tries to address it or talks again about why it's important 
Um, and I don't know if it was one of those things where it's like show off, like how good astrology is, it can predict something like this, or if it was more necessary for them, but it seemed to be a topic that was of ultimate importance in the life of judging a nativity. However, just as we found with like the predominator and the Agudespites G, we've got all the authors kind of trying to figure this out in their own way and having their own methods that serve them. Um, also, just for the future, I think Christopher Scott and I had talked about doing, because we're, it just so happens that we're in length of life in our Valens study group as well right now. And we've been actually working out length of life according to Valens in that other group. So we have it a little bit more in our bones over there. So it's possible that we might do an episode on the Valens technique of length of life um, with Christopher Scott. So watch for that as well. Um, Again, every author is coming to us with their own methods and their own techniques. I don't know if this is coming from their philosophical way of using these techniques or if it was developed looking at a bunch of charts and one and seeing one that worked better for them. But none of the authors do it exactly the same way. So we're just going to kind of lay out a little bit of the methodology behind the authors um, later in the video. Does that sound that sound right sounds good to me and so that i think that's a good point that has just been haunting us for the last i don't know seven chapters or something is no one agrees no one agrees with this kind of conveniently they all seem to use the same handful of techniques um which we will get into so it's in some ways a little bit more straightforward in other ways it's really not um, because they use them slightly differently. There's some weird like semi arcs calculating those. And um, there's just a lot more like math with this. Um, and we were just talking before we got on the camera of there's no computer program that will help you do this. So if you want to do these correctly, you know, get out a pen. There's help, but there's not just like a quick, you know, solar yeah. fire like button, right? There's help right. of like, we've got things that will help us calculate the um, walking through the bounds or mm -hmm. we've got the essential times tables. Um, and in the background, we're working on a couple of things. So send us good vibes for that. Um, Cause we wanna make this accessible and like something that we can play around with a little bit. And then of course there's, we can talk about this more when we give the examples of like, what does this really mean philosophically, right? So like, does the hit of length of life just show a hit to the vitality, especially, you know, this is the big thing in modern medicine, right? right? Pneumonia might have killed us back in the day and it doesn't now. So it's like, or we might be able to uh, get over some kind of critical life event. And actually today, the day we're recording this, um, the astrology podcast with Chris Brennan, they came out with the, um, like a death, uh, episode. So it was also very interesting because that's kind of colliding in a lot of the different areas right now with people talking about it. But it's something that a lot of astrologers bring up and they did in today's episode, which I didn't watch the whole thing yet, but how there can be acute health crises that are subverted more so in our modern mm -hmm. medicine era than might have been back in the day. But there's also different things that are of risk to us in our modern age. So you know, there's philosophical stuff, and I think we can get into that as we dive deeper into some of the episodes, because some of these are going to be our ideas and then our experiences with the different authors' techniques, and we're trying a little bit to stay true to Demetra's book, like we have been throughout the episodes, which is just like giving you a little bit of a brief overview of how Demetra presents it. And so we're going to do that today and then we can get a little bit more into each of the authors and like our thoughts about it and all of that in the future with more episodes on length of life. Right. And so Demetra starts out and this is chapter 96 and 97. She starts out chapter 96 um, by like Elsa was just saying, saying this is a really uh, widespread and important technique and one that in modern times is um, sort of full of controversy and people are saying we shouldn't predict life. I don't know if anyone is really like, I predict life for all of my clients, um, but ancient astrologers like would do that. Ptolemy is very clear that he 
does his length of life technique and stops predicting things at that point. He does not predict anything past the length of life. Um, and so Dimitri kind of sidesteps all this by saying, you know, I'm just reporting what is here. I don't, she doesn't seem to have like a terribly fleshed out stance on like whether she uses it or not. Um, and neither do we, I've never really used it. Um, but you know, just like she is, we're just going to outline, uh, basically what each author thinks. Yeah. I have, um, never used it per se with a client. I've never got any client asking me to predict that, but through my client practice, this year, actually, I've had a few times where I thought, aha, length of life would be good for this. And there are a few mm -hmm. occasions where I think ethically it could be done. Now, do I think it's the best technique for us to be like length of life first so I don't have to predict after 63 or whatever it is? It's right. like, okay, like how useful is that to us? And maybe it would have been in some context of kings and um, whatever back in the day, but like, is it at is it worth as much to us now? Probably not that many people even really want to know, but there have been instances where it would be nice to know for family planning, if you have a loved one who has death arriving, or if you yourself have a few vital years and you need to sort of really know how to consolidate them with inside of mm -hmm. your goals or your professional career. So there could be some ways to use it that would be helpful for a client and I think could be practiced with strong ethics in mind and also with not being like, okay, you're going to die here. Boom. End of story. Right. Like, right. so I think there are uses and I've seen in my client practices, how there could be uses. And I have practiced with the techniques given by the authors in, in study format, but not necessarily with clients, but I have seen where it could be of value if it worked well enough and if it was done with a certain prescribed ethics so that being said right and so yeah. you know just maybe another point on that is that i think it is also useful in itself to try to get in the brains of ptolemy of valens of dorotheus like that in itself even if we don't run around and use this technique all the time it's important for us to understand what they were thinking, how they would have used it, and sort of, you know, the the thinking behind the technique and um and their yeah, how and why. Absolutely. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It is important to our study of ancient astrology to know why and how they were using it and what their thinking was around it. Absolutely. Right. I completely right. agree. So she talks about there being divergent materials. A plethora of divergent material. Okay, that is Demetra's words. So just know that. And what I would recommend is, and I've recommended this with the predominator, with the Oika Despotes, with all of these sort of masters of the nativity. I really strongly recommend that you find the triplicity lords by this author, the predominator by this author. Like I think that you should find your predominator according to Valens, predominator according to Ptolemy, predominator according to Dorotheus, and like work the technique with that one author all the way through. Either pick one and just stick with that one, or if you're going to do all four, make sure that you're sort of not mixing them together, that you're doing all of Dorotheus's methods up through length of life technique with Dorotheus's prescribed technique, kind of like house systems, where it's like, if your teacher tells you to use this house system with this particular technique, just use that. If this teacher is saying to do this method, just use that. And in its own capsule by itself, and you may get different results with different authors, and that's totally okay. Just stick with it. Go all the way through to the end of length of life technique with that preferred author or with all four and try to keep really organized about what what which author is asking you to do. And then you can see your results, compare, contrast with your chart or with celebrity charts or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um the predominator is, you know, um, is the releaser in most cases, right? Um, as well as it could be the master of the nativity. So that's kind of what she starts us out with saying in the first part of the chapter. 
So often a planet or a point that signified the nature of the event being investigated was used as a point of reference in any of these timing techniques. So not just for length of life, like you could pick a planet and, you know, distribute it through methods of finding out a specific answer, not just when am I going to die or when's the native going to, or how vital is the life going to be for how long? Um, So this also, she talks about it being critical times of danger to the life force. So I think these kinds of nuances are proper to consider. Again, they'll be proper to consider in our modern life. Like, is this a blow to my health? That is a series of blows that eventually leads to my death after five or 10 years. How much of a hit on the vitality is this? And those things are worth considering. Um, So certain techniques were used, certain techniques use a combination of both time lords and direct timing in their procedures. The timing techniques used by Hellenistic astrologers to predict length of life include primary directions, ascensional times of the signs, planetary periods, greater years of life and the bounds, and we use the Egyptian bounds, circumambulations through the bounds, and the... I don't know how to say this either. The Hoiromea? Maybe that is, that's it. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah, that sounds it. That is it. I'm pretty sure that's it. Okay. Good job. Um, so then she moves on to kind of show us examples. She gives a graph about primary directions. So so basically primary directions um uses the primary or diurnal motion of the planets through the sky. So we have um the planets rising and setting and you know going into the earth and going back up that is the primary or diurnal motion and so what primary directions does is it basically just converts the motion of a planet in its primary direction into years of life and so she gives uh basically and this depends on a bunch of different things um but one zodiacal degree being four clock minutes of time being one year of life so We can say when a planet is, you know, we take it through its primary directions and it hits, let's say, a square with a malefic, then we can say during that time, and that will be more complicated to calculate because you're also calculating the directions of that malefic. That would be a time we would think um, is dangerous, a blow to the life force, potentially a death, depending on the circumstance. Yeah, and I can only speak to Valens, or I guess I can't only speak to Valens, but I'm more familiar with the Valens uh, length of life procedures, but there's going to be all kinds of additives to that. So it's going to be like, add years for this, take away years for this. Um, And you're not just taking away like clock years. If you're using the ascensional times, you're also using the ascensional times to get how many days or how many years so you want to just take all this with a little bit of a grain of salt yeah so Um, but yeah that's right you you're looking at the diurnal motion from sunrise to midday to sunset as an arc that would be the primary directions right so it's a little bit like secondary progressions or whatever it's called is a lot more common today and it's a similar idea where we're taking the motion in i think it's like the first 90 days converting one day to one year it's a very similar idea but what we're really doing is we're progressing 90 sort of like arc minutes um of time for for that instead yep okay so that there we've got the primary directions and then we're going to go into the ascensional times which is another method um, where I'm pretty sure you guys will be familiar with ascensional times, but ascensional times are the varying amounts of time that it takes a sign to rise over the ascendant. So this is where we get like straight up signs, crooked signs. So like, let's say a sign like, Virgo or whatever is on the horizon like this instead of like this it doesn't take that that image as long to rise as it would if she was upright from foot Mm -hmm. to head like say the virgin Mm -hmm. 
like upright foot to head or the virgin is laying down on her side, that is going to be, that's going to be um, important. And then the ascensional times and the ascensional timetables are going to be flipped depending on if you're in the northern or the southern hemisphere. So right. which sign takes what amount of time to rise, um, that's ascensional time. Right. And so basically, she has this table on um, 1127, saying that in the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere, like which ones take long and short to rise. And then on the next two pages, specific sort of numbers of years that you can take for that sign based on its latitude. Um, so basically, you in the find, like, you know, in the book, you've got this table or whatever but you can find these essential times i think all over on the internet like a yeah, lot of there's chris provide. brennan has one you can just google it i think like astroseek has one um but the idea here basically is that the number of years associated with that planet's rising is the amount of time that it takes for the significations of that planet to mature and become manifest essentially uh, um so that's essential times. It's that's one where we don't really have to do much calculation for. It's all been done for us. Um, the third timing method is going to be planetary periods. And so most people are probably familiar with the minor years of the planets, but we also here have the mean years of the planets and the greater years of the planets. And so, for example, uh, we have the moon here, the, the minor years of the moon being 25, the mean years being 66 and a half, and the greater years being 108. So that's going to be each planet is going to have the least amount of years, the middle amount of years, and the greater amount of years. Um, and again, there's many things that each author will do to sort of modify that. Yeah. So Firmicus, for example, is um, the one author who pretty much only uses planetary periods. And basically, if it's in really good condition, in a good house, in its own sign, in a good degree, you know, if it's in perfect condition, it'll give you the maximum numbers of uh, years. But there are many instances where it will be sort of ticked down. So it's rare to get the maximum number of years. Um, but it is a starting point And honestly, ending point for Firmicus, but it's used in several of the authors. Yeah. And I know, um, I don't know like how much Demetra covers, but from reading through Valens, the Riley translation, we've been working on this and Valens will have you, you know, calculate for both the predominator and the oikodespotes if in fact, like there's ways of ruling one of those out entirely, but then he actually says, take the planet that has the least number yeah. of and then you're subtracting from like the least, he's like, no, because I was like, oh, well, then you take the greater. No, no, <laughs> not according to balance. So, um, you know, there's people, people do different stuff. Okay. So, all right. I guess just to be safe, to not predict, like, maybe it's a safety net to right. kind of predict the least a number of years. So you're not giving them hope for like a, the greater right. or something like that. Right. So, okay. Anyways, that is planetary period. So we're using the mean the minor and the greater amount of years, and then having rules to subtract or add or take away from those numbers, depending on if you're using who, which plan, which plan. Which, which, by the way, we're not being secretive about. Demetra does not give these rules in this book. <laughs> and you have to really go, like, we're going to be going into it in Firmicus Maternus. We're going to give a special amount of time um, to length of life for those who are interested. Um, when we read over my thesis, and like I said, we might come to you with a video on Valens because we've just been nitpicking at this in private for so long that I think it would be really cool because we're doing this video to come with some chart examples from the different authors. So the only ones that I've really nitpicked would be like sort of the Firmicus Maternus and Valens. Um, but again, Demetra's kind of summarizing throughout the whole book. She's not giving like every single thing Valens said to do for all of these things. If you read Valens, he'll go on and on and on. You'll right. be like, wait, I didn't read that. Long time. Of course, because you're not reading the source text. You're reading sort of a right. general summary. And she does a good job of characterizing their the summary of what they are giving to us for those of us that don't want to nitpick through ancient texts. So, okay. Now we are so on. Yep. So the fourth uh, method is going to be the circumambulations through the bounds, um, which circumambulate means literally to walk, ambulate, 
circum around. So what you do is you take a planet and you have it walk around the chart at a specific rate um, and it will move through different bounds and the bound ruler of that planet will be like a time lord for that period of time and it will encounter aspects with various planets. Those will be like cooperating lords or like sub lords. Um, and so basically when a planet is in a bad bound, gets an aspect from a malefic, that's a time to look out for. Yeah, and there'll be like certain planets, depending on which author, yeah. that will be described as like the cutters, right? When you have right. the three yeah. fates, you have the one that, you know, sews the thread and whatever, and then you have the one that cuts the thread. There's mm -hmm. certain ways of determining which planets can be the cutter. And each author also kind of does this different, assigns who can be cutters and when and what to look for. <clears throat> so there's that. And again, we use the Egyptian bounds and you can find these, of course, Chris Brennan, I think has the Egyptian bounds to download, but I'm sure you can find the Egyptian bounds at, at all of the various astrological sites as well. Um, and so that technique is is an important one for a number of things, not just for length of life. It's, it's actually really, really useful. Um, and so this final one is the Horamea, I believe. I don't believe I'm saying that right. I have no clue. Well, um, I know the Horai. So, yeah. so she says uh, the Horamea, you know, given up on getting it right, are known as the hourly times. The hourly time of a planet is one twelfth of the diurnal or nocturnal arc between its rising and setting. The total number of hours between the rising of a planet relative to its zodiacal longitude, degree, and its setting, which will vary by season as well as latitude of birth is divided by 12. The hours are converted to minutes of clock time. The total number of minutes are divided by four expressed as degrees and the degrees are then converted to the corresponding number of years. And so this is, I think, exclusively used by Ptolemy. Um, and if that sounded complicated, don't think the rest of them are easier because it's seriously doing all of that kind of like wild calculation, even when you're using essential times or something yeah. like that. Because you're having to take off a certain amount of years, assign a certain amount of years, calculate that by, you know, it's not super straightforward. So you have to want to dive into the technique. So that's good for people who have fear around this. They're like, I don't know when I want to die. Well, you won't, <laughs> even if you kind of like read this chapter, you're not going to know. So <laughs> you're good. <laughs> right. And that's why I just, I just read that one. It's a little short paragraph. She doesn't place a ton of emphasis on it. Um, I've never used it. I hadn't heard of it before reading this book. I've never heard anyone else talk about it. Um, I so, suppose you and, if you're reading Ptolemy, if we have any Ptolemy experts out there that happen yeah. to be uh, watching the channel, come on and we will um, do an example of how to do this. Yeah. If you're interested, if this is your hobby horse and Ptolemy's length of life is your thing, reach out. We'll, we'll make an episode. <laughs> this The next chapter 97 is the overview of the procedures. Um, and she talks about the predominator as the releaser, the fetus, um, fetus. But she wants to let us know that, you know, the predominator and the master were um, used as determining longevity. But she wants us to know that these procedures, um, based on these two rulers, are not the only method for investigating length of life. Um, so they're not the only methods for investigating the length of life. Um, and Traditional astrological literature abounds with techniques that focus on the different planets and places and points. So we're just covering that again. Um, we've got this, you know, here she talks a little bit about the length of life versus the time of death. And I think that's pretty important because you could have a general length of life and then you could have the predicting like of the month or the day or the time or something like that um so we've got like the source of life which is our predominator we've got the master of the nativity which is the oikodespotes g which is the giver of life and then we have the curios which is kind of this trinity as she describes it with this transcendence of life and she just wants to let us know that this is not the only way to do it, um, these are not the only points that you can use. There's a plethora of availability in the ancient authors is, I guess, what she's kind of laying out for us there. 
Um, she talks about the term releaser, the controller, the effetes, and then in Latin she talks about the haleg, and then so then we have the Arabic helage, I think it is pronounced. So um, what I think is cool is that she gives this example of the charioteer being released from this starting gate in order to like enter the race. So we've got the starting gate and the finish line is kind of how they're, you know, talking about this within the words that they're using. Um, so again, we've got the the life force of the releaser, the life course, which is kind of the journey of the releaser, and then the conditions of that journey, which are the life phases. Um, so here she talks then about what the master of the nativity would do. And then, of course, the killing planet or the destroyer or the death star um so then you've got the effetes which is the birth star and you've got the death star which is the anaretes i think it is um which the pronunciations will be much sweeter and perfect once christopher joins the conversation <laughs> christopher's not like oh no i hang out with these people <laughs> so you know, she kind of goes over that and gives a lot of information on how to look at those um, planets. Balance calls it the controller. Um, mm -hmm. And people would refer to the releaser as this, you know, controller. <laughs> um, and I think, I'm not sure, but predominator might have been a Schmidt term. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Um, but yeah, so basically we have... Um, the releaser, which is sort of the planet that we're looking at, which is usually the predominator. So this is, if you remember, the predominator is ideally the sun or the moon, the, the sect light. Um, and it's this planet that sort of symbolizes the life force, gives you know life to the nativity. And then we have the master of the nativity, who's the one that sort of allots the number of years. Um, and that is usually done, she says, and this is on 1139, um, based on planetary periods. However, as we said before, this is not a uniform thing. There's all kinds of things that uh, she does not go into. And the Master of the Nativity was usually chosen as the bound lo lord of the predominator. Right, right. It's, it's for I think for every technique, it had something to do with you had to find the predominator. And then based on that, we would look for the Master of the Nativity. Um, and the master of nativity would like confirm the predominator, at least in the Dorotheus method, right? So we have this planet that is represents the life itself. And then we have another planet that says, okay, it's this long, right? Kind of like that. And um, sometimes you'd have to rule out one or the other, or you would just have one or right. you know, something like that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, and then we have the killing planet which when it is encountered, uh, and she says usually by conjunction or by some aspect, usually square or opposition, but there are other um, ways that it can be encountered, um, is going to be, sorry? There are possibilities. Yeah, there are other possibilities, and there are like specific like trines from certain signs to others, sextiles from certain signs to others, um, that when that planet is encountered, that is the planet that is going to sort of deal the killing blow. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, obviously we could generically look at the malefics as, you know, being the dangerous. She again talks about like the chariot racing being a dangerous sport with bumps and turns and grievous injury and untimely death and things like that with that kind of um, the words being used to show the, the destroyer, the life's journey or whatever it is. But it's generally a malefic, but like it could be the sun or even the moon in certain situations. Um, and it could be bodily, it could be encountering this um, Death Star through bodily adherence, through aspect ray, um, and different kind of ways that you would encounter something. And you would use your own judgment to say, hey, is this, what kind of blow is this? What kind of bump in the road is this um, to the vitality of the native? Um, so then we come to the procedures and we have procedures from Dorotheus, from Ptolemy, from Valens, from Firmicus, and from Paulus. Um, and so basically for Dorotheus's method, we have the predominator as the releaser, and then the techniques that he uses are circumambulations through the bounds and ascensional times of the signs using whole sign houses. 
Okay. And then we have the Ptolemy method, which um, the predominator is again the releaser, but Ptolemy is using primary directions, proportional semi arcs, eastern and western quadrants, the Horimea. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then with Ptolemy, he's asking us to use equal houses with yeah. this sort of arc situation. Um, and then we have Valens, which this is how Demetra lays it out. And I'm not sure if I if this is my exact understanding from reading Valens. So we'll, more on this soon. So the Valens method um, uses the predominator as the releaser, but it's not quite that simple from what I understand because he also talks about the um, oikodespotase and then ascensional degrees to get the timing and then uh, master and planetary periods and the proportional semi-arcs. She doesn't specify a house system, but we have been using whole signs, um, but he does when he's using this uh, proportional arc situation, there are pieces of this where you actually are using the MC and the IC, right? Mm -hmm. So this could show using these points as planetary strength, which could sort of open the door to talking about which house systems were actually being used for this if you're using those sensitive points as sort of the top of the arc. So um, it's unspecified. Right. And so she does mention that he uh, has two different methods and you kind of alluded to this earlier, uh, one involving the predominator as the releaser and another one as the master. And then she says, you choose the lesser. Yes, he has you to the last yes. Yeah. yes, which is, I don't know if it'll get cut out or stayed in, but we had mentioned <laughs> earlier in <laughs> the video, which, yeah, Valens is like the least of these. And you're yeah, like, I'll give, oh. I'll give you two <laughs> options, but you're taking, you're rolling at disadvantage. Yeah, exactly. Um, but he does allow for uh, uh, things to add years or, uh, yeah. uh, of course, always subtract years. Right. Okay. <laughs> So thank you, Valens, uh, for the using the lesser years of whatever two planets are up for grabs. Um, and then we've got Firmicus. And so then we, we come to Firmicus, and Firmicus is, uh, uses the master as the giver of life and then uses planetary periods. Um, and so this I mentioned before, basically, he has ways of saying if it's really well placed, like it's, you know, Venus in Taurus, not Libra, noticeably or notably. Um, then you will get the maximum number of years, you know, of sect, trying from Jupiter, whatever. Um, and then you sort of subtract from there. Um, he, there's this interesting sentence where uh, on 1144, she says, if it, the planet, the master of the nativity, being the giver in this context, was in its own domicile or bounds, or rising with a Libra ascendant, it allotted a middling age in accordance with its mean years. I have no idea why he would say that. Um, and then she says, when badly thing. placed, it could give only months, days, or hours. Yeah. And there are a lot of these kind of caveats with certain signs, like, yeah. and determining different cutters or different ways where you're like, yep, yeah, but you can't use it if it's in this sign. A lot of the detrimented or the fallen, like, like moon and Scorpio kind of situation, um, caveats like, yeah, the one just like specific things mm -hmm. that and maybe Firmicus will explain it. Who, who knows? Probably not. I think so. I think he's going to go on and on. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I think he's going to go on and on. I just did the outline for Firmicus um, Eternus Mythesis today. I just finished it and yeah. it looks like he likes to get wordy with stuff. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so then finally we come to Paulus. He uses the predominator as the releaser with the master of the nativity allotting the number of years based on its planetary period to the sign that it's in um, and then uses circumambulations to progress that and find the um, killing planet, basically. Mm -hmm. The Death Star, the end. So then she goes on to give a few concluding remarks and that brings us to the end of the book, my friends. 
Congratulations, everyone, for getting through the book. Yay to everyone that's in this study group with us. Um, it's happy and sad. Like, I am i can't believe it kind of went fast. Like, we were like, oh, my gosh, this is yeah. a big kind of commitment. And then it like went <laughs> fast. That's why I think we're like more interested in doing it again with Firmicus because you look at two years out and you're like, oh, my God. But to get through it is like so joyful and mm -hmm. so fulfilling to be able to do this work with you guys. So congrats, everyone. Yay, we did it. My book has taken a beating. Mine too. Oh my last goodness. Couple of years. <laughs> I know. For that's, sure. that's, that's what it's for. And, you know, so I say this all the time that the, like, when you read a book, it's one thing. And then when you talk about it with other people, that's when it really comes alive. And so I read this book right when it came out, read it again, um, like as we decided to do this and then have read it for, you know, a third time very slowly. And there are things in it now that I just, entirely missed the first time around like most things that we've talked about have just went right over even though as we we're talking about at the beginning this book is not that complicated like it's laid out she has a real way of explaining things in a way that is digestible but fulfilling and not like elsa was saying not like basic or watered down um, and so i'm reading through it the first time i'm like oh yeah it makes sense makes sense makes sense and then i'm we're talking about it in these groups and i'm like oh my god this is there's so much more here than the first time i read it it's um, like that with no. books. They're like oracles. Like, and obviously they meet you at your different scope of learning. So each time you read a book, even a novel, you're going to pick up on like different nuances that maybe your brain was blanking on the first time or whatever. So it's like, you're meant to hear the first things the first time around. Cause like, that's where your brainscape is like available to or for or whatever. Um, and then each time you go through it, the nuances you pick up on things or, you know, that's why it's awesome to go back and read like even advanced astrologers, like, you know, diving into Permacus or Valens or whatever it is, going back and reading some of these first books or listening to these first, first pods or whatever um, on your learning journey, you can pick up on way different stuff because you're at a different time in your life or your ears or eyes are opened in a new way. And I think working with a group and working with all of you, thank you. And thank you, Matt and David, we wish you were here. We, no, love we miss David. David. I know. Um, and working with David and the rest of the crew is that um, it, not to say it doesn't have value to go back again and again, but it almost expedites the process a little bit. Like, cause you have so many brains thinking of it. So you have different questions popping up or mm -hmm. sometimes you have similar questions where you're like feeling affirmed in your thinking or someone brings up something that didn't hit you the first time, but then you are forced to like go over it and ponder it again. And it just, it makes the learning experience, it expedites it by having more minds on it. And it makes you smarter from having to like talk about it and really think about it. But it also just adds a layer of like fun where normally you might just be like, nah, not into it this right. week, whatever. Right. And yeah. it just like adds a solidarity and like we joke around about the authors and, you know, so that yeah. really makes it more fun and doable to get through, you know? Yeah. And so I'm looking forward to that with Firmicus because I've, I've read the um, Holden translation like two years ago and it, I'm, I just looked at the pages. I don't like. Yeah. I, I it was. I, I don't think any of it sunk in. But no, I know. We threw it a second time and talking about it. It will. It will really come alive. I hope. But I think you know when we like look at like the first time reading Valens, it's like Chris Brennan's giving you these excerpts to read, and even an excerpt is like, oh God, please let's not. And then you're like, you've gone through 17 pages, and you just probably looked at the pages, like you yeah, read them, yeah. but it's look, it's you blanking out on the pages. And I think like that might be happening for us with the ancient authors or whatever, because of like language divides and just like oh, your mind is spinning. But I think some people feel that way, even just about entering ancient astrology and might feel yeah. that way when just looking at Demetra's books or just when looking at Chris Brennan's book or some of these introductory books where they're thick and they've got a lot of process to them. And so mm -hmm. I hope the this series has helped that journey for people. Um, sometimes just even knowing there's other people out there doing it, like we're really fortunate. We've made a lot of friends in this community and we have each other, but that was part of our motivation for making this a public space and making this YouTube channel as well. Cause like, 
I live rural and I didn't know anyone before this. And I know what the feeling of like reading these things by yourself and your com your interest just being yours. But to find that common ground is really rewarding <laughs> and um, like necessary. And we've been blessed with such an amazing crew that it's like, let's open that up. Let's expand our reach on that. So if you're somewhere and you don't have like astro friends, like going through this book with us on YouTube could be, you know, part of that journey of kinship along the way. Mm -hmm. So we hope that it has inspired you and that people are using it that way or that it reaches people that it needs to in that way. So that's a part of the mission of doing this. So you know, I hope it has reached you guys. Um, and for those of you who are in the pod, again, thank you so much for being a part of our journey. Okay, until next book, until next video, until next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye.